Welcome to Dune Chapter by Chapter. I'm Dominic. In the last chapter that I talked about, uh, things really came to a head. That was like the initial spark where everything really started to go to hell for the Atreides. Uh, up to that point, the novel had been moving kind of slowly, the story moving slowly along, and it was like at the slow buildup from the time that the Atreides left uh, a Caladan to arrive at Dune. But with the last chapter, now things have really taken a sharp turn and things are starting to kick into, I guess, high gear. And uh, the last chapter we saw that Dr. Yui uh, has revealed himself as the traitor. We all knew he was the traitor, but he has revealed himself to Leto as the traitor. As uh, he uh, hit Leto with the stunner dart, he killed uh, the Shadow Mapes. And now Leto knows that Dr. Yui is indeed the traitor. And we get to see the full... Uh, we get to see how all this this plan Dr. Yue has to get back at the Baron. We kind of see how this whole thing's going to work from this last chapter. Because he's going to use uh, the Duke as an instrument to get close to, to, get close to the Baron. And uh, he's fitted the Duke with a poison gas tooth that once the Duke bites down on it, hopefully the Baron's in close enough range can give a strong exhale and then fill the room with poison gas with a poison gas tooth very interesting weapon <laughs> uh, now in this chapter uh, everything is falling apart pretty rapidly for House of Treaties so Lady Jessica so just a quick rundown of this chapter so Lady Jessica wakes up and she's bound and uh, she's disoriented doesn't know what's going on not only that she's gagged and then she realizes that she's on the floor and then she starts to piece it together in her mind when she came back to her room. It was She entered her dark room. Someone was in there and, uh, you know, used some kind of a drug on her to uh, knock her out before she had a chance to do anything. And then uh, the Baron shows up and gloats over her with Piter. And uh, uh, then in this chapter, she and Paul are taken away in uh, Harkon and Ornithopter. And they're taken out to the desert. And they're going to be taken out there, killed, and left for the worms to eat them to get rid of any evidence. And that was actually the uh, suggestion of Dr. Yui. Because Dr. Yui also has another plan to not only betray the Atreides, but to betray the Harkonnens as well. Uh, so what's interesting about this is, uh, uh, with this chapter, is how when the Baron shows up, He's, he, him and Piter have a weird relationship. They're always playing mind games with each other. Uh, so the Baron promised Piter de Vries that he could have the Lady Jessica. She could be one of the spoils from them uh, destroying the House of Atreides. And God only knows <laughs> what Piter de Vries wants to do to her. That's totally left up to your imagination. But you know it's going to be something extremely demented, sinister, perverted, and it's not going to be nice. And then uh, the Baron also wanted to have Paul for his own, you know, uh, flesh, fleshly appetites or whatever he has as well. But he even tells Piter, well, you know, I had to give up the boy. So, you know, I'm going to give you a choice. Yeah, you know, you can either have uh, Lady Jessica or you can have, uh, you know, you could be a Duke here on Arrakis. You know, what would you rather have? And, uh, you know, the Piter, Piter is not like, he's a good mentat, but... Where he's twisted, he's kind of got some blind spots. Where Jessica, observing this, sees that the Baron is playing a game with him. And the Baron has absolutely no intention of giving him any position of power. And uh, why the Baron's like toying with him like this, I don't really know. It's just kind of like this weird game they have with each other. So, Piter decides, okay, well I want the power instead. And uh, so anyway, then the Baron leaves and the Baron tells... Uh, you know, Piter, well, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. You know, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to know about it. anything about what happens to, you know, uh, Lady Jessica and the boy. And uh, the reason why he's doing this, in case they encounter a truth sayer, uh, they, they can, he can honestly say he has no idea what happened to them, with all honesty, uh, because he, he, he won't know what happened to him and he won't hear anything about it. And... Uh, same thing with Piter. Piter does the same thing. This is a way to kind of protect themselves with uh, against truth serum. Similar to what Dr. Yue did in an earlier chapter where he kind of learned that when you're facing off of Bene Gesserit is you have to be as... You, you have to tell the truth as much as you can. That's the best defense. 
is be as honest as possible and tell the truth as much as you can uh so they don't uh so you don't like actually lie but uh you kind of hold things back but you still have to tell the truth up to a certain point so that's kind of a interesting uh, thing and uh so then there's uh some harkonnen guards three of them i think in the chapter and one of them is deaf uh, so Jessica can't use the voice and they have her gagged on top of that. So her, uh, she's rendered basically powerless in this uh, chapter and the special bonds to have her bond with, the more she pulls on them, the actually the way they're designed, the tighter they get. Uh, and they start to cut into her more and more and more. So she can't struggle against them or they'll cut into her. Uh, these special kind of bonds they have. So they took no chances with Jessica, uh, even having the deaf guard, the special bonds and having her gagged. But Paul, they underestimate him. They just got him bound up with a rope and there's no gag in him. So they don't really, uh, they have no clue how dangerous Paul actually is. And uh, because he's got a lot of this Benny Gesserit training. But does he have enough training? That's the, that's the thing that we have to find out in this chapter. Does he have enough training to actually use the voice and, uh, uh, you know, get the guards to obey his commands using the voice? So uh, Harkon has totally underestimated him. So then the Harkonnens take them both away in an ornithopter out to the desert. And so while they're out there, they're trying to think of some way to get out of get out of this situation. And then uh, one kind of uh, springs up. <laughs> and it's the Harkonnen. One of the Harkonnen guards, he's taken a real liking to Lady Jessica. And he thinks, you know, it's she's such a lovely woman. You know, we're just going to take her out to the desert to get rid of her. Like, why waste it? No one's ever going to know. Uh, you know, let's have our way with her. You know, we'll get her and her son will be gone anyway. The worms will eat them. No one will ever know this. And we can have... So that that's like their opening right there. So then Paul uses the voice and tells the guard to take off his mother's gag. And he tries it once at one point. It doesn't work. And then he attempts it a second time telling the guard to remove the gag. This time it works, and the guard actually does it. He removes Jessica's the gag, and uh, so then she, is, with all her Bene Gesserit training, now she can use the voice to a much greater extent than Paul, because Paul's not fully trained in the voice. He's not there yet. Uh, he was enough to pull that one thing off to get, the, you know, to get them to remove his mother's gag, and uh, so then she can take over and go the rest of the ways with the voice. So she does so. She'll, so she uses the voice and tells the guard, you know, you guys really, you know, do you guys really want to fight over me? And kind of plants that idea in the guard's head. And so then he like turns on the deaf guy, kills him. So now the deaf guy is taken out. He's done. And so then uh, he's then going to kill Paul. But then she convinces him, well, you know, wouldn't you want me more cooperative? You know, if you kill my son, I won't be as cooperative. You know, if you let him live, just let him go. Let him flee into the desert to the, you know, safety of rock. Because at this point now, they've landed on the surface of uh, the desert. And uh, so then he goes to throw Paul out. But Paul is able to deliver one really good kick at the guard and actually crush uh, his heart. <laughs> and he kills him dead. And uh, so then, then they escape. And a uh, few things about this chapter, about this whole scene of them in there is this is where the voice and one thing I, I guess it is kind of explained in the book but i never could really wrap my brain around exactly how the voice is supposed to work um because the thing about dune it's not hard sci-fi so there's a little bit of like almost like fantasy elements sprinkled in and uh like how would this like there's no way like like that's one thing i'm always wondering i always wondered about the voice how would it work like, what is the kind of, like, I guess, the made-up science behind it is what I'm getting at. How this is actually, how they are actually able to get their voice to the right pitch where they can make someone obey their commands. And uh, now this is one of the big examples of something that George Lucas lifted from Dune and used in Star Wars. With the Jedi mind trick that Obi-Wan Kenobi uses in the original Star Wars when, you know, he tells the guards, you know, these aren't the droids you're looking for. It's just like the voice, the Jedi mind trick. And uh, now I know here lately there's been a lot of comparisons between Star Wars and Dune. Where people are saying that basically Star Wars is like a carbon copy of Dune. I wouldn't go that far to say that Star Wars is a complete Dune ripoff. Uh, I would, because there's, it's 
it's a big, there's a lot of uh, Flash Gordon in Star Wars too. Very, very heavily. Uh, a lot of Flash Gordon elements are in Star Wars. Big time. Uh, George Lucas borrowed from a lot of areas to, uh, you know, to create Star Wars. But uh, this is one of the obvious ones, is uh, the voice, the Bene Gesserit voice, and how that's just like the Jedi mind trick in Star Wars. But uh, that's one thing I always wondered about, is how it actually works. Now, the other thing, we get to see Paul use some of his training to kick the guy and uh, with a precision kick, pretty deadly kick, one kick and he kills the guy dead. Uh, it's pretty impressive. And that's the one thing that's really missing from the David Lynch film is like Dune has, a, well, like a martial arts aspect to it with the weirding way and the hand-to-hand -hand combat and stuff and the knife fighting and all that. That's not really present. Well, it's pretty much non-existent in the David Lynch Dune. And it's something I'm hoping they do. From the looks of the trailer, it looks like they're going to have more of that in this film. And they kind of did it with the miniseries, but I know I don't really, didn't really like the way they did the weirding way in that one either even though it was more closer to the book where it was a fighting style. But I'm curious how that's going to be done in the new film, The Weirding Way. And uh, uh, that that's one thing that, uh, you know, that is in Dune, is that like martial arts aspect. Now, not that high wire kung fu style of martial arts, but there's some like very precision, you know, fighting, like throwing kicks and punches and stuff like that to kill guys with one shot and all this. So... I'm hoping they incorporate that into the new movie because that's something that uh, it's, it's something that surprised me. Because you know, remember, my gateway drug into this whole uh, series was actually a David Lynch film, and uh, I had watched that movie like a bunch of times, and uh, you know before I read the book, and so I was it was a big shock when I first read the book to find out how different it was from <laughs> the David Lynch film. Uh, I was expecting like the, the weirding modules with the sound blasts and all that. I was expecting all that to be in the book. And then when I read it the first time, none of that was in there. So the weirding way was a completely different thing. And uh, which I think I like the whole idea of it being a martial art is a lot more interesting than it being a piece of technology like they had in the, the David Lynch movie. Although I do think the weirding modules in the David Lynch movie, the whole idea of using the sound to fire a weapon and all that, that's a cool idea. If it was in another martial, if it was in another science fiction movie, like if David Lynch had saved that idea and then went on and did his own original uh, science fiction movie, and then had those uh, sonic modules in there, uh, because the idea itself is a cool idea. It's just not a good i. It's just not a good representation of uh, the Weirding Way, in my opinion. Which I kind of like the more physical combat aspect of it, where they have such you know the Bene Gesserit have such control over their bodies you know they can control their metabolism and they can you know they can use that 100 percent control to you know uh, you know survive out in the cold because they can heat themselves up or you know to hold their breath for long periods of time or to slow their metabolism down or to actually speed it up so they can move faster and be stronger and all that so it's almost like a super powered so the fighting style they would have combined in with that would be almost like a superpower itself uh, the only aspects that were kind of in it in the, the David Lynch one is where Lady Jessica grabs Stilgar by the throat and she's holding them, making that growling noise when she grabs him by the throat. She kind of overpowers him and grabs him by the throat. That that was the only like hint of a martial arts aspect in that movie from the Weirding Way. So yeah, so in this, uh, you can see that they've completely underestimated Paul. Uh, they didn't think he was going to be any kind of a threat. They just used regular rope to tie him up. Uh, they didn't gag him, and uh, you know they paid a dear price for it because uh, Paul was able, who at this point in the story he's still only 15 years old, uh, was able to kill a, a fully grown uh, Harkonnen guard with one kick to the chest, and uh, you know on top of that able to use the voice to trick the guard, to ungag his mom, so then his mom can really do the work on him, and then uh, the you know the chapter ends with. Uh, you know, the another ornithopter because they're always being watched, the Harkonnens. And then it's reason that, well, these guards, as soon as they get back and they tell them, yeah, we got, we did the deed. Well, they're just going to be killed anyway because they want to avoid any run-ins with any truth sayers. So they're even going to kill the guards if they, if they had made it back. Um, but uh, the other thing in this chapter and it, well, in this book in general, I always come back to this, but 
They really, Frank Herbert really does a good job of making the Harkonnens such loathsome villains that, like, they have, like, zero moral compass. Like, they're just ready, well, you know, why, if we're going to kill this woman anyway, we might as well, you know, do all these horrible things to her <laughs> before we, you know, we might as well have our way with her. You know, and then just whatever Piter de Vries had cooked up in his mind that he was going to do, like, they're just really, really terrible, terrible, like, villains like just horrible like getty prime if you're just like how what is it like to be a citizen on getty prime so i wonder sometimes i'm just absolutely horrible to be living on that planet you would have like no rights you could be basically killed at the whim of any one of the harkonnen guards or any of the higher ups in the harkonnen military or you know it would just be terrible and they kind of you kind of get to see what life is like if you read the other books by uh brian herbert and kevin j or Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So yeah, so now this this is another chapter that's pretty good. I really like this chapter. It's another one of my favorite chapters that stands out. And this is another one of these key moments in the story. Like it, every time they're going to make, every time they'll ever make a Dune movie, like in the new one, like this scene's going to be in this movie. Like this, the scene from this chapter, it's going to be in the new movie. It was in the David Lynch one. It was in the miniseries. You know, 25, 30, 40 years from now, they make another Dune movie, like a, another adaptation, or, if, you know, they do a Dune TV show. This scene's going to be in there. It's just one of those key scenes. Uh, so, you know, really good stuff. Really enjoyed this uh, chapter. Really like this one. So that's everything I got to say in this video. Let me know what you think in the comments section, and I will see you at the next one.